um, maybe with the assistance of some others in this room to, uh, to queries. So I'll just begin. I wrote it on my phone, so sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna have to look at my, my screen very quickly. Um, so thank you to both of our artists today for giving us the privilege of watching your films. And so I'm very grateful to have the privilege of responding to you. Um, just a couple of things that I noticed uh, when uh, reviewing these works. Um, I really appreciated the, a sense of loss, whether it be uh, the loss of access of, uh, to a key informant uh, or a key subject, or maybe even the loss or the emptying out of um, cultural and maybe natural icons, only to be replaced by new meanings inscribed by a changing urban environment. Um, however, this sense of loss is not to be confused with nostalgia. I find that these films deny, uh, deny us as viewers to merely lose ourselves in nostalgia, but rather turn to the process of loss into a productive investigation, perhaps through ethnographic means, such as interviews with the community or archival research, and perhaps even a almost formalistic study of light and color and sound of a particular environment. In this case, I believe it's near a casino. Um, and additionally, <laughs> in Chang Lung's work, we can see this process of self-discovery as part of that investigation, a self-reflective journey that integrates the filmmaker, the artist, um, and also um, An Chan's uh, own academic journey with the archival and ethnographic research of that subject. And then I found myself as a viewer experiencing the sense of trying to peer around a boundary or a border, maybe even a wall. Um, sometimes I felt that had to do with a lack of access, a lack of information, perhaps gaps in historical records, um, and maybe even large financial and capitalistic structures in a certain sense. Um, so in Lena's, um, or uh, artist Lynn's, <laughs> Urban Street Nightclub, we are looking at a, a fence, a barricade, with these various iconic Cambodian images and also text. Um, and I might ask you to maybe share about that text uh, um, a surrounding casino. The camera I found is very straight on, looking directly at the fence, and it's almost flattening. Um, it's shot at night. It allows us a very little variation in angle or setting. Um, and we don't really get a sense of what, how much time is passing necessarily. Um, what I also notice in this viewing is that the depth of field is really interesting. Um, sometimes the light made the, the images on the barricade appear more deep, like deeply focused than even the pedestrians and the scooters and the vehicles that are passing by. They are much flattened compared to the image behind them. Um, so I also noticed that um, these passerbys and the traffic were also not really interested in the image. Um, they're looking straight ahead wherever they're going from point A to point B. And our um, attention as viewers is really focused on the image behind, but there's little concern from the subjects. So I'm curious about that. Um, I'm wondering, uh, as the artist, could you give us some insight on the filmmaking process? How did you decide to focus on these particular um, images and the barricades, and <clears throat> could, um, I'm also interested if you could tell us uh, if there's anything specific about that particular area, or are they similar to other ones around the city? Um, and uh, I also noticed that um, there's some dialogue, or maybe not dialogue, but there's uh, we hear some voices, maybe about around minute 11 and 12. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us maybe what they were talking about, if it had anything to do with, um, or like how, why you decided to focus on that, or bring our attention to that, and also about the text um, uh, on some of the, the fences as well. And then for, so another quick question, so sorry, I, I tried to make one question, but I couldn't do that. But for Chum Long's film, um, Elegy for the Time Being, um, I found myself really taken by the scenes integ integrating recitals of poetry, of music. Also, we see a lot of repeated shots of trees and skies reflecting a particular fall or wintry landscape. Um, and the music tracks are, uh, and the final performance at the end of the film are really striking to me and very moving. Um, so I was wondering if you could share with us, since we have a lot of students um, who might be interested, <laughs> uh, what your process was for deciding um, to incorporate such elements in your film. And could you share, I think your, pro, your film already shares a lot of your positionality, 
But I was wondering um, if you could share a little bit more about that aspect at the beginning of the film regarding the your position as a student within this academic institution. Um, how did that structure or that particular institution affect your filmmaking in any way? And of course, maybe for both filmmakers, how would you, uh, for both artists, how would you view, view the relationship between the historical or archival or urban landscape um, between that and your own, um, uh, your own work and your own practice as well? <laughs> so you can address any or just one of these or you don't have to address any of them. We can Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you. And so, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Suyen Foundations and Food Brides for uh, having this program and having me here. Uh, that's mean a lot to me to present my words. Uh, thank you again. So also thanks Lima and together with other artists in the rooms. Thanks to student for spending time and I hope some of the student wrote about my words. So. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for interested in my work, but I I will also learn from you when I read your poems in one way. No, so yeah, uh, thanks for again for really in depth, uh, you know, uh, looking in almost all the elements of my works. Uh, you know. I couldn't read as much as you can, <laughs> since I'm you know so much into the work itself, uh, and I trying to answer to some of your question if I can answer right or wrong you can also mention it again no? uh, to me the work itself uh, uh, it's already 10 years almost I mean now 2022 uh, it was 2013 um, this is the a year after when I uh, had an exhibition of a work called Urban Street Nightclub no, a work of rap future considered as number one and number two, which is exhibition and Nguyen Foundation. Uh, so basically, I'm just photograph uh, corridor fence, no? starting from 2009 to 2012, and that's what been written in books of uh, Pamela, uh, and you know, launched recently. If you already wrote, so there are some information in there. Um, yeah, after that works in 2012, these will come along and it's, when I see it first, uh, the reality, I see it's already like a, it's, it's a video works. It's not a photography work, sorry, come back again, the Rev Future one is a photography works, and very static, very straightforward, the same style like this one, instead it's a photography, it's a still image, this one is, I don't know, video, moving image. Or, but again, again I, I keep it very static, so I keep it very, a little bit on, you know, bottom, the, 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 the grounds, the top, a little bit of the sky to give an element of what it is about, but also to uh, definitely, you know, to make it very flat. Um, I'm inspiring a lot to, you know, a lot with paintings and uh, uh, um, I'm looking a lot of, you know, photography because of my base is photography, uh, a lot from Europe, of course, in America, <laughs> in one way. So that's inspired a lot into the reality that I'm interested in. Uh, you know, Urban Street Nightclub, to me, is a, is a, is a series, theatrical, uh, theatrical reality. It's a reality, and, and it's very theatrical. So it's, it's very staging. So. Uh, like a particular image at the moment, uh, you know, it's just a moment of time based on an image. But imagine is 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 a video, a reality, uh, a living so people cross by from one to another. So those to me is is a uh, you know, reality, but also at the same time a uh, uh, staging and and theatrical. So it's like an episode of life, you know. Uh, this place is. Uh, uh, constructions to connect uh, construction for underground uh, walk and supermarket to connect uh, the first uh, casino called Nagawol in the centers of capital of Phnom Penh to the second casino of Nagawol, Nagawol again. So they're building this uh, by looking at the, uh, the 
tax on the fan itself uh, is written to make Phnom Penh become more beautiful by building a casino in the, in the centers of uh, um, uh, Phnom Penh. So for sure, this fan is belong to the casino. This area and under construction belong to them. To me, uh, building a f building a casino in in the capital to make Phnom Penh become more beautiful and more it's it's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. At the same time, uh, building a casino, but at the same time promoting an ancient, iconic Cambodian image. Uh, this is another philosophical, uh, I don't know, metaphor, uh, manipulation. Uh, you know, in one way, it's it's very much about. You know, you not you didn't notice because uh, at daytime uh, it it's just very physical, it just very flat image, just an image. But at night time, they, t they turn LED light on. I would say it's similar to a cricket or an animal that, like, you know, happy with the, the lights. It's, you know, I would say uh, too much to the people that we are also addicted into a disco light. You know, uh, uh, that's why it's come about to urban street nightclub. You know, and uh, ideally, to me, like, is it not enough to not just? To, is it not enough to just you know place the image to attract people, but instead? They even put more LED light to make it more disco and attract you more. So that's similar thing. Uh, I could even think like they attract you more to go to play game in the casinos. So that uh, you know interests me. It both image, image is you know from a, a photography base is really much about image. But when image manipulate with the color is another layers of image makings, and that's what I always interested in. And that's attract me, and it's coming to the world. And uh, yeah, I think I hope I can answer that. No? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, so much for sitting through 76 minutes yeah. of the film. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you again to the Monet Foundation and my colleagues at Fumbray as well uh, for organizing this event as well for Lina to be in Vietnam. <laughs> um, I actually really love this piece because in some way it kind of gives us this vision of Angkor that is very eerie, mm -hmm. like a, almost like a haunting image, mm -hmm. even though its development is a new casino being built, but it's the past that remains yeah. right, in the urban landscape. Um, about my own progress of making my film, um, um, full disclosure is that it's the film that I made my first year in the PhD program. Um, and I was very interested in this figure of an older woman who always showed up at any Vietnam-related talk on Yale's campus. And she's, she was quite old, um, when Yale was really old at that time. And I, I approached her and I wanted to talk to her about her husband, Wing Sang Tong. But at the time, it uh, was pretty much from a documentary perspective. Like, this is a scholar who was a, one of the first people to translate to Gil. So I see that as almost a gener generational imperative to learn about his story and to kind of give that to a larger audience. But the way that she turned out my ideas and really refused to allow me access to that kind of story um, kind of turned this question of representations around, right? And I, I, it made me question the certain kind of violence that's going to the act of putting someone in front of the camera and telling their story as if it's the only story that is about their life. Um, and so during that period, um, I tried to rethink my approach. Um, and I used some kind of inspiration from um, Charles Sander Peirce, um, semiotics, to think about the way if there's a certain historical object that I cannot get access to, right? Uh, to the sign, and my student here would laugh about it, of course, because we talk about this all the time. The sign who is the woman, right, has refused me access. So I have to create alternative signs um, in order to approximate as close as possible to this one objective historical um, meaning. And so I decide to go at it uh, in a more tangential, uh, with a more tangential approach. And I kind of put the camera back onto myself and to other people who were living at Yale at that period. Um, because for me and for Vanian as well, it is very unreasonable to try to talk about someone else's experience in an institution uh, without telling 
uh, without reflecting on the way I myself and other people is also going through the same progress, right? It is a story about Vietnamese intellectuals living and trying to make uh, an imprint in the United States. Um, so in that sense, I, I approximate first semiotics um, and try to tell a story through uh, a triad, right? The story of Winston Tong, myself and my friend Andrew at the School of Music at the time. Um, but that did come with a lot of archival research, um, many of which was not possible uh, to do just on campus, and that's when I kind of reached out to people who knew him before. Uh, uh, Thomas Fox, who you've seen on the screen, he was also a historical advisor for another film called, uh, called Hearts and Minds that was produced in 1973, um, and that was right around the, the period of the Paris um, agreements on Vietnam, right? uh, the Paris Accord on Vietnam. So those are people who actually inhabit um, a lot of the larger discord on the wall. And so I, I had a chance to talk to him and kind of rethink my idea and, and, um, and reframe it as an elegy. Right? I do not have the right to, to represent the story of the scholar as the only story. But I have the right to tell my way of thinking about a story. And so I make it into an elegy and get people who knew him to give the remark on him. Um, and it's for the time being because many other stories can be told about the same person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much uh, to both artists. So I think I will just open the floor now um, to any questions from the audience. We have maybe five minutes <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Go over. Okay. Oh, <laughs> 15, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so, any, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Can I ask? Oh, do you have a I think I saw a hand here. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, spreading the time showing us your amazing films. Um, I have a question for you, John. Um, uh, so, you post um, through your, like, I think, performance um, of uh, throwing paints on, on the map. Um, you uh, posed a dilemma between uh, remembering and forgetting, and you kind of worked through that dilemma from that point to, to the end of the movie or, or the film. And I think um, at the end, when you talked about uh, Go In, uh, you, s you respected her choice to forget. Um, so uh, I, I just want to ask you, if you have arrived at an answer for that dilemma, or um, do you uh, think that there's something that we should forget and something we can remember, or um, is there a compromise between the two, uh, the, 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 the two choices? Should we collect questions first, or do a back and forth? Do back and forth. Back and forth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for that question. Actually, um, in the in the first draft of this film, I create five different chapters. So it kind of it, you watch it as a reading book, right? Um, but this question of remembering and forgetting, I think, is crucial for the younger generation who try to understand the conflicts in Vietnam in the past. Um, and it's also, I think, it applies because in my in my larger kind of PhD work uh, in Cambodia, actually. Right. I encounter this, this tendency to forget very often right, among community of people who survived the violence of the past. So they really did not want to discuss their experience. Right. Um, certain people would say yes right away and they want to make their story heard, but many people want to remain silent. And that was one of the motivation for me to pose a question of remembering or forgetting. In some, in some circumstances, forgetting can be violence, right? When you try to tell one singular history and make other people seemingly forget about alternative way of thinking about the same event. Um, but in some cases, like, uh, like with Gu Yin, right? the way she forgets and or she wants to present right, her story as an absence, so to speak, um, is a very conscious choice for her to deal with the past trauma and the psychological uh, bit with of what she went through. Um, so in my film, I actually pose as, as a conundrum. And it kind of reflects in the, in the choice in the final uh, five minutes not to reveal her face um, 
as I was going to her house, right? And I talked to her, discussed with her about that process, um, and I, I told her, I will only reveal your bike, right? And that was the decision that I came up together with her, with her agreement, with her consent, right? Uh, and, and I have to kind of show my final, almost the final cut of the film to her, and get that approval before I can put in the final uh, photograph of her and her husband. So in that sense, I'm telling the story of forgetting and remembering with the agreement of people who live through that period, they would be the one who have the ability to decide whether forgetting or remembering is the answer at the end of the day. And as an anthropologist, I can try to come as close as possible to that quote-unquote right, object, um, but I will have to respect the decision of people who survive and live through all the trauma that I try to put onto the big screen. Um, so, answer, I don't have one uh, for whether we should always forget or always remember. I think it's a negotiation depending on the context of representation and also depending on who we are and what we want to achieve out of this. And for me, it, it merely is an elegy. It, it's my admiration with this scholar. And I, I need to kind of leave it at that. Right? I'm not telling this is the story of the war, per se. But, but I think this um, binary of the dilemma of forgetting and remembering, it lives with it every day. Thank you. Another question? I guess I'll, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, both of you. Um, I hadn't seen either of these works, so it was really uh, a real treat. Um, so I have a question for Chum, because I, I met Hui Santong. I gave a lecture at, at the Yale Center in 1994. <laughs> I think your painting might be in her house, though. Oh, <laughs> oh I didn't know that. Um, I'm curious about, I don't know how I'm going to formulate this question, but your choice of him as a subject. Um, I was you know, pleasantly surprised that that was the subject of this film, um, but, but it's not an obvious choice. And so I'm just wondering if, how you, how you came about choosing him. Was there another story that you wanted to tell and then you came across him when you came to Yale? Or was he the subject all along? Or was there how much uh, accidental uh, encountering uh, <laughs> was there in this. Um, so I think it, the film kind of born itself out of co coincidence, actually. I think I, when I was deciding on my PhD program, um, the story of an Yale was one of the reasons why I decided to go to Yale. Um, because I can see this uh, the imprint of the present of generations of Vietnamese people who had tried to come here and try to make a name for themselves, and uh, the way that she developed, almost a visual archive of such history, for me it was very important. So in some way the, the, the project actually started with her and not with Queen Sang Tong per se. And that was the, the reason why the main concern for me was she said no. That was the most important uh, moment in, in my kind of um, in the gestation of idea for this project. Um, and I actually learned a lot about her. She was one of the first Vietnamese people to come to the stage to study music. Right? And I really wanted to talk about her story as much as his. Um, but the more I talked to her, I realized that uh, she kind of tells the story of her, of her life according to what people know of his life. So, so Von Ian really kind of framed her life around the achievement of her husband. Um, so in that sense, when we talk about the idea of making a film, um, she really frowned upon any image of herself at all. And she kind of just pointed me to, oh, you can talk to uh, about my husband, but don't tell my story, right, in some sense. So Queen Sang Tong, uh, at that point for me, was more like a myth. At Yale, because everybody kind of talked about him at the university. Uh, many people who knew him actually fell out with him, so they all left the university or they they retired. Uh, James Cook was one of the rare cases who uh, 
decide right away to appear in front of the camera. And uh, he has his own attitude and personality, and that was something I had to work with. Um, but the story really born out of this very fortuitous uh, encounter with Ian. Um, in some way, I really want to tell her story, but it's not possible. So I have to tell her story through her, her husband's story. Um, thank you for um, letting me ask the questions. So I have two questions for the two artists. Um, the first is um, for uh, Lim and. <coughs> This is more like a question of my friend who really um, excited about your film and its visuality and it's like, um, like it feels quite observational if like I don't know if that if that's the word but like you put your camera and it's quite a long it, it's a completely long shot and then people just move back and forth and so my friend is really interested in like it feels um, not free form, but it's not bounded in the narrative structure of like a bit beginning and an end. And so, like my friend wanted to ask, like, what what do you like? What's your intention behind like approaching such a narrative and like whether like a beginning and an end it's necessary and like, what do you think about it? Um, I don't know if I should ask the next question right now. <laughs> So this is my question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this is my question for the um, Okay. <laughs> so. Um, so uh, the question of representation is something like I also have an icky about, and so like in the film like the like starts off with that and I'm interested in how like the extent of like I think collaborative storytelling has a big part to play in this especially bringing your best friend Andrew into the story and also taking his own story and his own music as a storytelling device um, within the film so I'm interested in like how like can you talk more about the process of you two working together and then also, how music is, is I find, uh, also a collaborative storyteller in this. And yeah, I guess like it's, it, it would be interesting to see like how you see it, like it's um, kind of imbalances the, the story, the one true story about Bing Seng Tong, it's because you also incorporate and intertwine with like lots of your stories and I really like it. Like especially the music is so beautiful. Yes. And the film, yes. That's okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, I guess that back to the 10 years ago, what is my intention and decisions on uh, image and all those image, you know, editing and post products? Uh, uh, I I don't find it very complicated, but I just follow, you know, the amount of footage that I took. So, uh, I did took as much as I can. It's um, uh, around a kilometer long corridor fence and a different image. I tried to choose, you know, not random, but selected, carefully selected, that is not duplicate. Uh, and then I select them and I follow that. Uh, that's why it's become six minutes, 16 minutes and more. Uh, I found it sometimes boring for myself because I keep seeing the same thing and I feel some of the audience also find it boring, but that's what is, uh, that's what is the word and the project is about and I respect that. So I am generally talk to my project a lot, not just only that I make the project, but my project also lead me to what it's supposed to be. 
uh, the same to my later project letter to the sea that I read two letter under the sea and that it took me 17 plus minutes to take the oxygen out and read at the same time and uh, feel comfort until I finish it for 15 minutes no more than 70, 17 one seven minute and the editing is follow that so I that I so I do that to respect my projects and I think uh, that's the intention uh, yeah in the work to start or to end uh, for the yeah the urban street nightclub they look the same so you you didn't feel that you know whether is it the beginning or the end and that's what it's really good about this particular kind of work I believe yeah and that's if that answered that yeah. The question about music um, actually pops up a lot when I show this film uh, in other contexts as well. Um, I consider the music to be a character in the film because um, uh, in creating this project, I collaborated with Antra, who uh, became a subject in front of the camera. And I work alongside an Icelandic composer um, so that I can talk and discuss my ideas with my music advisor at the same time. And he created music in response to the images that I created. So that's why it's always, you have this feeling that it's always a, a conversation between image and text and music and, and things like that. So the whole project was pretty much a collaborative endeavor um, that we all came to th together and framed as in the end, if Van Yen still said no, we'll still have a, worth, uh, a worthwhile project because it's our kind of interpretation of uh, the past, right? Um, so I approached Antern uh, about this idea and he was very interested in being part of it because um, we both realized at some point that um, we all thought that we were the only Vietnamese people in an institution trying to do this thing. But in fact, there has been generation before us trying to do the same thing, right? trying to study <coughs> Vietnam, or trying to make their name as Vietnamese uh, identifying people. Um, so he, he, when I told him about the story of the old scholar, he get it, um, and he decided to help me. So that collaboration unfolded. But we really went at it with a mentality that we don't know what's gonna happen in the end, right? And so that final decision of the widow to let us uh, go to her house and get access to the recording, that was completely unknown when I started the project. So the film actually unfolded as you see it on the screen, right? All of this unfold in real time, so to speak. Um, and it's the collaboration was significant in the sense that you also give me a year, right? Worthy of, of a line worthy of being filmed because I, I have to enter my own um, self into the films. And in so doing, I kind of transform my experience being in such institution as well. So for me, th that was the reason why collaboration was uh, at most important in this project. Right. Um, yeah. okay. Do we have, we can fit in one more question. Oh, oh, we've got one question, one last question here. Um, actually, I have two questions, but <laughs> can I? Squeeze okay. it in, squeeze it in. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, all right, so the first question uh, is for the, um, the Urban Street Nightclub film. I would love to ask that, um, because your work is an idea to respond to the, um, I would say, the development of the city and how ridiculous it has become when they try to take more and more att um, like attention of people. So my question is that I can see that there are a lot of kind of um, decoration and kind of way they try to show the development, but, um, but like it's over, over overwhelmed so why do you choose to um, approach the uh, the phenomena of of the LED light and the panel with those kind of image 
and how it is really significant in the urbanization and develop in Cambodia. Um, the second question is for Ji Jiang. Um, I, I would I, I really love the, the story and I realize that in your in your work um, it's, um, it's like uh, an inter intersectionality of um, the memory uh, about uh, Professor Tom and also your your um, your narrative, your process, and also your your friend. So I would love to say uh, I would love to ask: um, Did you have an intention about this kind of intersection? No point in your narrative, or it just came when you approach the Tom, and then you realize or you study something like about the process of yourself. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I can <laughs> answer that right, but I think I could start from my interest of. What you said about the significance of it in related to development. Uh, I myself interesting. Well, uh, we can say that uh, I'm actually graduate from economics backgrounds, and uh, my interest into big, into the micro and macro, uh, you know, elements and, ma and elements of, of development, and uh, at the same time, uh, I'm very interested in the observations and objects found. Uh, a lot of my work lately is involved with not just only taking image but making image by you know making other things in the landscape that I photograph because I see the, the landscape, the reality is not enough to represent what I want to say. So uh, I observe that very carefully so that's why uh, the fan itself and the LED is up here very strong. Uh, coming back specifically into the fan, the, the corridor, because it's, to me it's a very symbolic of developing. So of course you can see everywhere, I would, I would say not only in Cambodia, in Vietnam, but also even in America, in Japan. And it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's become very globalization language of understanding that, oh, this is a you know, construction site. This is something that's going to happen or something already destroys or the history is you know being destroyed and you never know what it was or maybe war, not sure what it will be in the future and then that's I found is very fascinating that the fan is represents the uncertainty in one way uh, uh, the fan represent itself you know uh, you know uh, the hidings the the reveals uh, you know it's the same like the other project I call Rap Future, you know, the, the future is being wraps or packaging that you never know. Is, is it a presence when you open it? Is this a, a surprise or maybe not? Um, yeah, so so that, uh, yeah, I'm so interested in re the reality and, 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 and what is reality in the reality that I see sometimes doesn't present uh, strongly enough as what I want to talk about in my practice. So I have to play around with that to, to add something in so that I can you know, find a good test to talk about my practice and what I want to say. I find that uh, idea of a gift, the box, yes. very precious. It's, 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 really, it's really interesting and fascinating. Um, in some way in Vietnam we have so many similar examples. And usually the fence is a promise. Like they promise you, in a few years, this is what you're going to get. And then in reality, not everybody going to get it. Right? Only a group of people. Right? And, they change, something and, else. and then the company sell the project to someone else. Yeah. Um, so it, it's so fascinating. Um, thank you for that. About, about this process of creating the, the storyline, um, it really came out of the experience of being at that particular space, at that particular moment in time. Um, and I think at that time, I was very interested in the question of semiotics, right? How do you get to understand something as an approximator of certain idea? Um, and, and so reading through all of that material, the, the theory, the, the kind of philosophical musing of different scholars on the topic, 
kind of motivated me to think about the, the documentary project in a different way, right? Not as one singular answer, but uh, a multitude of different interpretations. Um, so that's how it came about. And uh, together with my friend Anne, actually, we, we I think, encounter an interview that Tom has done with uh, Professor Peter Zinnemann. Actually, maybe Nora, you would know this. Um, but Peter Zinnemann got a, a personal interview with him saying, Tom, and, and through that uh, text, we, we read through it, and we realized that he answered one of the, one of the questions as, uh, the two things that I really love the most in my life is classical, Western classical music, right? And extra, extraordinary things. And here I, here I was with a friend who was a professional classical musician. So we, we decided, okay, why don't we just make a film like a tribute to him because this is what he perhaps would have loved, right? To just listen to a good piece of music. Um, and so that was the, the decision that, that motivated me to, brought, uh, to, to bring the three storyline together. Thank you so much for the two artists. Um, I believe uh, we should conclude our event <laughs> now. And have a great evening and rest of your weekend, everyone. Thank you to the Art Foundation. <laughs> Just take a look.